Good evening, brethren. Good evening. Um, we've heard this weekend um, during this festival how God's purpose will not be frustrated. Uh, this is one thing that's come out. Uh, his immutable counsel is just that, immutable or unchanging. So this is what we've so seen about this, that we have an unchanging God and what he purposes will happen. We have heard that we would not even need this word immutable if it was not for God. I mean, who else, can, who else or what else can this word describe but God? So this is why this word is even here. And even though this is true, there are some that still find it hard to believe God. And it's some that find it hard to believe that he even purposed the cross of Christ from the beginning of the world, that this was his purpose. Many don't believe this. The immutable counsel of God has to do with this purpose in Christ Jesus, who is the slain lamb from the foundation of the world, which is mentioned in Revelation 13.8. This was God's unchanging plan all along. The cause of men's problems were because they were hostile to God and enemies in their mind. They had no peace with God. So this, the, our prayers was a perfect introduction to Brother Tony's message tonight. Um, because he's going to speak about this peace, the peace that we can ha that we have now with God. Ephesians 2:13 says, "But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ." And not only are we able to to draw nigh, but we're able to overcome as well. This is brought out again in Brother Gibbons' message, uh, how our High Priest has made a presentation of His own blood in heaven, and now he's administering blessings from heaven. We're being perfected. So we're able to be overcomers because of this blood of Christ and what he has done. And we're able to stand perfect before God because of this peace that we now have. We're able to be the bride of Christ because of this peace. We have that kind of intimate peace with God. This is how precious his blood is, how precious Christ's blood is. Um, and this truth of the keeping power that God has of this peace that we have, it, it, it keeps us, it makes us able to overcome because we can remember that God is immutable and we now have peace with God because the devil would have you think that you don't have peace. He tempts you all the time to say, no, you're not, you're not in with God now. You, you've thought this, you did this or whatever, but we have peace with God and God is immutable. Brother Tony's uh, text is Colossians 1.20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And Brother Tony will focus on this blood-bought peace we now have through Christ Jesus, which is part of God's immutable counsel. When they bound him and led him away, then Judas saw that he was condemned. He repented, him, he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned. I have betrayed the innocent blood. The innocent blood, this phrase is lifted exactly from Psalm 94.16. They gathered themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemned the innocent blood. Let's just remind everybody right now, that's what we're talking about here in this scripture. And we tell the world too, brethren, that this blood in our text is no ordinary blood. This is not a common blood that runs like through our veins. This is the innocent blood. It flowed from one who knew no sin. He was entirely, this one was entirely guilt-free, sinless, and neither was he a victim either. Mm -hmm. He gave himself for us. Yeah. He gave himself for us unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, God started teaching us from the very beginning about such things as this, sacrifice and blood and death, perfectly illustrated right off the bat in the Garden of Eden. You remember this, when he covered the nakedness of, Abra of Adam and Eve. Only God could properly clothe them, and he made coats of skins, and he clothed them both. All the sacrifices from that time forward in the, many, in the years to come 
all the absolute countless number of sacrifices, they were all innocent. Animals had nothing to do with man's sin and transgression against God. I say our sin. Adam and Eve, our sin, because, see, it belonged to us, brethren. We come from that lineage of Adam. What we are, it comes from him. If the tree be corrupt, the fruit is corrupt also. Now, we know that the, the blood of innocent animals were used as a substitute for man's sin, that God taught this uh, vicarious sacrifices, and all the sacrifices and the elaborate ceremonies and the formalities of the priesthood, the sprinkling of blood and the, of calves and, and goats and with water and hyssop and, uh, and wool was to teach about the gravity and the seriousness of sin, that sin was transgression, and it was foremost against God. It was transgression against yeah. him. And the soul that sinneth shall die, God said. Sacrifice speaks volumes about how serious sin is. Uh -huh. God wanted us to, he wants us to see uh -huh. the seriousness of sin in this way. I sometimes wonder if men even today understand that not doing what God says is considered sin. Uh -huh. Straight out yeah. sin. Yeah. God considered it because this fact has not been pressed upon the minds of men today. This has not been the message heard from the pulpits that in this land. Jesus did give us the command of God, didn't he? He said, Thou shalt love the God, uh, with, uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind and soul. That's what he said. This is the first and great commandment. Amen. <clears throat> now, you know, God, and I long for the day that God can raise up men, and he will, to call sin for what it is. Men, uh, God can do this. He's done it in the past. Men like John the Baptist who gathered men uh, and, and all these people at the Jordan River and he called sin for what it was. It's God who raised up the prophets in these days to bring the message of repentance. And we know that every gospel preaching preacher that's been raised up, God done it. God raised him up to declare his truth. The co this country is in sore need of men, like a good old gospel revival meeting, you know, like no good old tent revival meetings, where sin is condemned and where men were not afraid to call sin sin. Once again, warn the people the wrath to come, who were, uh, and to warn uh, of the coming of Christ, the imminent return of the Lord, and the judgment of all men that's forthcoming. This is an urgent situation today, because the soul that sinneth shall die. It's not, uh, it, well, it is. It's uncommon to hear men speak uh, about uh, our due respect and honor to God as being sin. It's a sin not to honor God, yeah. brethren. Amen. It's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And God, you know, he doesn't go to sweep this kind of thing under the rug like men do yeah. and, and, and just pretend like it didn't happen. We've talked about that this, this weekend. Mm -hmm. When God don't obey, when men don't obey God, there's a problem with that. There's a problem with men, and Amen. God will address this. He said that he would. Mm -hmm. We can't listen to people when they said that we're unkind mm -hmm. when we charge the world with sin and transgression. You know, there's, there are those who are trying to label the gospel message as a hateful speech. Yeah. You know, that when we tell men straight out that certain things are sin, they said this is a hateful speech. There's no time that we can go soft on sin and wickedness. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> because the solution to our sin, brethren, was a serious matter. Redemption and atonement had to be by his own blood. I'm talking about Jesus Christ's blood. Hebrews 9.10, Christ entered into heaven with his own blood that they which are might be called, might receive the eternal inheritance. Now, you know that uh, the most central thing in salvation is Christ Jesus. We knew that. We talk about this all the time. Everything in salvation hinges on him. He is our salvation. Every type and every shadow, he is it. Every blessed and holy name, he is it. But you know this thing about redemption and the plan of redemption that, that an atonement that brings us, so to speak, into the salvation of God. The, and the reconciliation and, and the redeeming of man. You know, blood is a central thing in this. The blood of Christ, very central. Redemption depends on the blood of Christ. Because it takes 
It would take Christ's blood, his life, to bring us to God. Now, I don't expect brethren like yourself to even flinch or bat an eye when I make a, a declaration such as this because you receive this. This truth is so dear and clear to your hearts. It's accepted by you all, but you try to make a claim like this today in the midst of all the other gibberish you hear. <clears throat> it wouldn't hardly be heard or received at all. It's just not what people want to hear, you know, about blood and his cross and things. I think it's because men generally just to have no interest in these things, draw near to God. They have no impulse toward holiness and godly living. The commonness of sin it, it doesn't alarm them at all. Not even someone else's sin doesn't alarm them. <clears throat> now, the blood of Christ is everything to us, to the saints. And actually, they don't realize it, but it's everything to humanity, mankind, totally. It's everything because of who we are, you see. We were created a little lower. We were created a little lower than the angels. But our nature has fallen below even like maybe the animal kingdom or something. Man is like, he, he's evolving all right, and it's a moral development. And, it's, and I see it going downward. Yeah, uh -huh. Amen. The song goes like this. I've heard it. It's a beautiful song, actually. Jesus is our Redeemer. And he saved us by his redeeming love. But, you know, I'm thinking about, what about his redeeming blood? Uh -huh, you yeah. see? That's where redemption's at, brethren. Uh -huh. That's what I mean by it's central yeah. to our salvation. His blood. Amen. Okay? That's, what, that's, what the scriptures, they, that's what the scriptures single out. It's his blood in redeeming. The sheer value of his blood. That's what we're talking about. The value of his blood to wash away sin. That's what we're talking about. It makes his blood like... A precious blood, don't it? Yes, huh? When you consider the value of it. Now, the apostle of the Jews saw this. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, Peter was quick to associate precious blood with a lamb uh, that was blemish-free and spotless. Now, I looked in Esword, and it says that the word precious is used 17 times in the New Testament. Guess who used it over half them times? Peter saw, Peter saw, he saw him himself that he had a precious Lord on his hands. So with his own eyes, now, he was a precious Savior. There are rebukes and strong admonitions contained in the scriptures. They were unavoidable and necessary, and they were given to address disorder and heresies and things like that. But every time they are used, they are unwelcome and unregrettable to the progress of the Spirit's work because really, it's, it's, it's themes like this that it, it, uh, foster our growth and our progress. Our progress and growth is made when truths of this caliber can be made and sought upon. It's just, such as the one we have before us tonight, the sanctifying blood of Christ Jesus. If those in Christ Jesus could just get a hold, all the professing believers is what I'm talking about, if they just could get a hold of the value of the blood of Christ in regard to their personal need for cleansing of sin, then everything about sin would change. <clears throat> sin would be a, like a horrible and, and loathsome thing then. Now, you know, for us to really get a handle on the redemptive work of the blood of Christ... <clears throat> We needed a little help. It was need for us to, to consider uh, what it says in Hebrews if we, if to understand the work of the blood. And it, it, we'd learned there in, in that letter that Jesus' work was a better work. <clears throat> he was a better minister, it says, of a better covenant because what Jesus did had eternal ramifications. It was just not an earthly thing that uh, the priesthood did. He had having obtained an eternal inheritance for us. Now, there's no doubt, brother, we, we talk about it all the time and, and we love to look into it, that Jesus' earthly ministry was absolutely staggering. It was. He, he actually staggered the people with the things he said and did. He uncovered and laid bare, well, hardly any problem at all, the hypocrisy of a man-made religion. Now, he did that. He confounded the selfishness and the self-centeredness of the multitudes. 
when it sought after him. He did this. But this is nothing compared, brethren, to what Jesus did eternally in the heaven when he entered glory with his own blood. And this is what Hebrews is talking about. Understanding what took place when Christ returned victoriously into the eternal realm and came again into the presence of God. Well, the Hebrews, it, it, it helps us understand this. It would be an impossible task to understand this otherwise if God had not provided a way of portraying it all in the ministry of the priesthood, particularly the ministry of the high priest. The priesthood, we know all that, that was done there was a, about the good things that were to come. That would come through Christ Jesus. That's what, that's what all that was about. It was about good things to come. In Leviticus, God spells out the requirements for the atoning of sin, which was temporary. And in Hebrews 9, the appropriate application is made to the eternal. Eternal, which was in Christ Jesus. It's made there. The high priest, he entered to make atonement for the people once a year. He had to enter the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sin offering. The sin of offering was specified according to God's requirement. The high priest could not enter. You cannot go in there without blood, without fear of death. The point is made in Hebrews just as the earthly high priest entered the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sin offering, Christ, our heavenly high priest, enters the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, with the blood of the sin offering. Amen. The fact that Christ brought his, with him his own blood is that Christ gave his own life, you see. Uh -huh. He sacrificed his own self. That's, that's what it speaks when he walks in with his own blood. He enters him with his own blood. Because our blood, brother, had no value uh -huh. in redeeming. It was contaminated. Our, our blood had no quality. We didn't have a quality blood yeah. like Christ had. His blood was valuable enough to God to secure our freedom. And cleanse us from sin. It was valuable because he was a son of God. Valuable because he was absolutely righteous. Yeah. Christ's blood, it had, to, it had a quality to remove sin. Precious blood. Now, he secured for us eternal redemption. Re eternal. It reaches that far back and that far forward. Eternity. Jesus' work was a better work than the high priest of men. Because his blood was better. This blood flowed from a human body, just like ours does. But his body was one that was perfect through and through. Now, you know, when the Lord left the presence of God and returned again with his own blood, this is to be seen as one great mission, all of this. And a, a, as a mission and a ministry that's presently ongoing, you see. It's continuing. If the work of salvation required that Christ enter heaven with his own blood, how do we think we can enter without his blood? I think Paul was careful to say <clears throat> in our text, it was the blood of his cross. It's just instead of saying the blood of the cross or something like this. Because it was on the cross, on his cross, that redemption was made. Redemption was done on his cross, meaning it was what God did to Christ after he was put on the cross that produced or affected, brought in our redemption. It was God who put Jesus on the cross, in other words, not men. The point is made emphatically over and over and over. When they tried to take him, remember, but he walked right through the crowds in the midst of them. His time had not yet come, the Spirit tells us. Jesus speaking to Pilate, he said he had no problem telling him, you have no power over me except it be given to you. He was stricken and he was smitten and affected by God, afflicted by God, Isaiah said. And then Peter settles it categorically when he says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. This was the immutable counsel of God, by the way. <clears throat> the cross of Jesus, his cross, it was appointment by God when you consider that God makes appointments. According to God's unchanging purpose, that, that's been our theme this weekend. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 22. Now, here's some words of encouragement. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom. As my Father hath appointed unto me, Christ had obtained an eternal 
inheritance for us. And it was by appointment. When we have a sovereign God who operates as the unchanging one, everything is, everything is done by appointment only. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> People just don't show up. That's right. <laughs> and things just don't just happen. They're, they are done and accomplished according to God's appointments. Mm -hmm. It is the immutable counsel of God to give us a kingdom, brethren, because we are continuing in, in the temptations of the Lord. And, brother, we're going to continue after the fashion of these disciples here because we want in on the kingdom of God, the one that God has prepared and, and given to the saints. Mm -hmm. Paul said, having made peace with God, <clears throat> I want to bring this to your mind this evening, brother, so that you'll, you can have an opportunity to the glory in this wonderful provision. I, I want to say one last thing about the blood, though. Christ has reconciled all things by the shedding of his blood. Every, I mean, why, why I want to say this is because every absolute thing that sin had affected, the blood of Christ reconciled, Amen. made right. Mm -hmm. And believe me, okay, sin corrupted everything. Mm -hmm. Sin was absolutely unlimited in its corruption. Everywhere that Satan has been, he's carried this corruption with him. <clears throat> And we know, we know by the record that even somehow, somehow, even some of the angelic host were affected by this delusion. But the blood of Christ, of this one man, Christ Jesus, has reconciled all things to God. He has done, he has reconciled these things because he has removed sin, all sin. The text says, the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Yeah. And another perspective from John. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. <clears throat> now the reconciling and the removing of sin took place on his cross. It says, Who? His own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree. Yeah. To wit, that is God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now how can God not impute sins to the world of men? They were guilty. Every last one of us guilty. How does God not impute us guilty of sin? Because God, in Christ Jesus, he bore them away yeah. on his cross. Yeah. So then when God looks at the saints, mm -hmm. he looks, he sees Jesus Christ, brethren. Because his blood, his, his blood has washed and cleansed every one of them. God has made a provision by which sin can be addressed and men can be redeemed. So we say to all men, be ye reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, I absolutely love this picture <clears throat> that's portrayed of Jesus in the account of the woman taken in adultery. I appreciate so much uh -huh. Brother Jason pointing this out to us. Uh, very vivid. How did Jesus respond to her sin and her accusers? Why, Jesus stooped down and he stood up. Uh, praise God, brethren. In response to our terrible and wicked situation, Jesus humbled himself. He stooped down. Yeah. And he stood up victoriously. Yeah. Amen. Mm. Remember, it was after Jesus stood up that he said, Neither do I condemn thee. Yeah. It was after he stood up. Well, Jesus, I, I praise God that Jesus stooped down yeah. and that he stood back up. You know, I can, it makes me want to do the same thing. I'm willing to stoop down with Jesus. I am. I'll stoop down with Jesus so I can stand with him. Yeah. Amen. Having made peace. There's nothing ever so much precious in this world as this. We've talked about it a little bit tonight. In this world, even in this earthly world, it's nothing so much precious as peace. That's what all this turmoil is about. <laughs> Men trying to achieve peace in the world. That's all we hear about really is peace, isn't it? <clears throat> what will a man give for peace? What will a nation do for some peace and quiet? We fought World War Wars trying to make peace. You know that. Did you know World War II is still the most deadliest war there ever was? Uh, Eighty million people were killed in that war. 
to try to bring peace. So 61 countries were involved. At one time, there was 1.9 billion people involved in that war, World War II. Now, listen to this. But to secure real freedom for men and to assure true peace was what's accomplished by one man. Yeah. Not one man. That's right. Amen. The man Christ Jesus, yeah. <clears throat> Christ made peace. It's what's being said here. Right. Imagine yourself being in a situation where you were against a person or something. <clears throat> you were against it. Mm -hmm. But you were inclined to try to change the circumstance, <laughs> if you could, so you no longer had to be against it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, this automatically, if, if you think about it, automatically you're going to have to have somebody help you out. Yeah. You're going to have to have a mediator or somebody to intercede yeah. for you because uh, you're personally against a situation mm -hmm. But and, and you can't get yourself, can't get involved in it. Yeah. So you're going to have to have someone to intercede. I know the world certainly doesn't understand, but I don't think many believers really understand either. Yeah. I don't think they, it's, a, it's a preacher's fault yeah. <clears throat> that, that they don't understand that God was against us, yeah. uh -huh. that God was actually hostile toward us, brethren. Yeah. <clears throat> what happened between man and God? Well, it happens all the time in our earthly situations. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, even in our situation here, there's times when parents and children can be alienated from one another because of things we do or say. Yeah. And uh, uh, parents sometimes can be a bunch of low lives, so, so much to the extent that the children can't even have anything to do with them. They, they, they so corrupt. Uh -huh. The human race, brother, had been so corrupt and wicked, uh -huh. God couldn't have anything to do with them. He just had to stay, kind of stay away from them, if you know what I mean. The point is because God was against them. That's the point I'm trying to make. Now, God wasn't, God wasn't going to stay away and just ignore the situation. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> uh, people who are not like himself uh, uh, certainly could not be ignored by God. He wasn't going to ignore them. God is not going to tolerate and wickedness to remain. Don't get me wrong. But the, he had to remove himself. If people don't believe this, then they don't believe Noah and the flood. If they, if they, you know. Now, Scripture said that God is angry with the wicked every day. <clears throat> that this is God's mind toward transgression of men. It's not popular to mention it today. But, you know, we've got to just tell people what the apostle said, that those who do not believe in Christ Jesus are condemned already. Right. We just have to tell them that. There's an anger and a wrath that abides on all men who have not come to Christ Jesus. That's just the way it is. It, the seriousness of this situation is made clear to us when we understand that a member of the Godhead had to come down here and reconcile the world back to God. And this is what the gospel is all about. <clears throat> Too many have allowed Satan to come in and gradually, he did it gradually and very subtly, he, uh, and they pull us off this very main point, <clears throat> the point <clears throat> that's made in verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he had reconciled. Christ made peace, meaning that this didn't exist before. There was, there was no peace, brother. Okay. There was no basis for peace at all. There was not a foundation or reason for peace. Peace didn't exist. Peace, now this word comes from peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers for that shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, along with many other things that we know of God, and we know that God is a peacemaker. He's a God of peace. Paul begins this letter this way. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. It's a wonderful thing that God has given to know him. <clears throat> He's revealed himself in these ways. So we can actually learn about God. We can know his ways. And, and we, can, we can, to a certain extent, we can predict, predict the manner of God and the kingdom. But there's one thing we better not ever forget. He will not acquit or clear the guilty. He's a God of peace. Yes, he is. And, but we are at peace with God when we are in agreement with him, you see. And how this works, how this works for those who are living by faith, it, it's, I've read it already. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is how it works. We are in agreement with Christ Jesus. Now, in the context in which our scripture sits, 
<clears throat> beginning with uh, verse 13 particularly. It is the Father that hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and he hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. He did it. Paul is extenuating the excellence and the dominance of Christ pertaining to all things that come from God. You see, he's, he's highlighting that, <clears throat> that Christ is complete, complete entirely. He is abundant and overflowing with the supplies of the fullness of God, verse 19. And he is the one who has made peace with God, this one, that, we're, that is complete. The kind of peace that Paul is talking about is a kind that had to be established. It's God's peace, you see. <clears throat> now, another word for peace, you know, it's harmony. That's another a word for peace. That's a good word. A better word, though, is agreement. Christ Jesus made it so that we can be in agreement with God. Yeah. We, can be, we can say, yes, Lord, in other words. Amen. That means that nobody, nobody has a right not to be in agreement with God. Amen. It's beyond belief. I, it really is. I mean, it really is. When you consider all the provisions that God has made and put in place in the gospel itself to retrieve men that after all this length of time in which peace has been established by God, that the, the entire world, I'm sorry, but the entire world is not at peace with God mm -hmm. after this length of time. Amen. I mean, really, do you, when you think about it, all this, all that's been done and the world still is not at peace with God. Well, I'm going to skip this paragraph because I'm not going to go into that. <clears throat> but mankind has proven one thing. Yeah. Jew and Gentile both. They proved it. But if God, wants to get, if God wants to get something done, he's going to have to do it himself. Yeah. Amen. And for this reason, you can expect more to come from God in this aspect. And we can thank God and praise him that this mess that's going on with the modern church is not here to stay. That God is going to deliver us from it, and he's going to bring salvation on the earth after all. Another reason that Paul argues the case so strongly in this first chapter, the saints have been reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. Christ is our reconciliation, 1 Corinthians 1.30. We are joined to the Lord. That's how we have access to the Father, through him. Outside of Jesus Christ, and we just need to say it, there is no exception by the Father at all. That's like it's been said so many times, God, can't, God doesn't see you, hear you, or anything like that if you're not in Christ Jesus. We have no access to the Father at all. Paul, he's warning the brethren, actually. He's warning the brethren. He's warning the saints, their family. You see, and he's warning them because on the heels of Paul are the false teachers and leaders they ride dog in Paul's heels everywhere he goes. They're the, they're the false teachers and leaders of a new movement, see. They are. They've taken the form of Judaism and they've mixed it with some of the doctrines of the Lord. And they're to call them the party of the circumcision. That's who they are. <clears throat> According to their teaching that uh, if you come to Christ in faith, then we, we'd like for you to be circumcised too. <clears throat> and, but beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Paul told them straight up, hey, you don't need a circumcision of men. You don't. God has already circumcised you. He, God has already performed the circumcision on you, in whom also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and the putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ Jesus. He said, don't listen to these men. And Paul goes on to shut these men down before they get there. It was a religion, you see, like a lot we got today, that operates in the area and the realm of the flesh. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, he is the captain of our salvation. He is our peace, in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sin. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the God of peace. And he has called us into this perfect peace, mm -hmm. brethren. You know, I think that if God is not mad at me mm -hmm. no more, then I really don't care what everybody else thinks. You, you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I can have peace with God, then 
you know, I can, I can navigate in this world and not really be that much concerned mm -hmm. about what everybody says, particularly the heathen, those outside. I mean, yeah. you know. But <clears throat> the immutable counsel of God, the things of God, the, the things of a God who changes not, mm. those things as I'm talking, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Who are they for? Who did God intend these things for? Well, the scriptures say, unto the heirs of promise. Yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Now, in Revelation 13, 8, uh, Sister Melissa mentioned this. We learn of a book there. Mm -hmm. It's a, the book of life of the Lamb. The Lamb slain, it says, from the foundation of the world. Now, the names that are found in this book will be kept. It says in that verse, incidentally, that they'll be kept throughout a time of great deception that's poured out on the earth. These, these brethren will be kept. I want to imagine in my mind that it's because those names have been written by the blood of the Lord, you see. The innocent blood, brethren. Let me close with these two scriptures and I'm through. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, brethren. Amen.